Get my notes up. <laughs> I love your notes. <laughs> crinkle, crinkle. It's in like my pocket. It. It's a pleasing sound. Yep. It's good to see you guys. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Autopod Decepticast. This is your bi-weekly podcast delivering an episode-by-episode episode breakdown of the original G1 series. This is episode 109 of the Autopod Decepticast, and what that means is we're going to be covering episode 5 of the original G1 Transformers cartoon, an episode titled Roll For It. And uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my uh, my name is Aaron, and you know it had to be sometime around 1988. Uh, I was trying to sleep, and this voice was calling to me to enter a staircase and in a door into another dimension called Subcon, uh, and begging me to save it from the heinous villain named Wart. And I, so I gathered up my crew. I'll let you guys decide who is who. A tall, mustachioed high jumper with a penchant for green and a sawed-off asshole fungus who knew how to <laughs> pull weeds and dig like sand. and Dig like sand? How about dig sand like a motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> and I should mention we also had a female with us. Let's just say it was Melody and she floated. But together we traversed the grasslands Deserts, waterfalls, ice, snow, night, desert again, and finally, the fucking sky. And along the way, we defeated all the Birdos, the Triclides, the Mousers, Fire Birdos, Fry Guys, Claw Grips, and ultimately, Wart himself. We restored peace to all the land before waking up to discover... It was all a dream! <laughs> uh, gentlemen, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Toad. <laughs> I'm Wet Sprocket. <laughs> I have no idea what this is. Really? No, I don't know what this is. He didn't, Mar- have, he didn't have cable, and he didn't he have. Guess he didn't have an NES. Super Mario Two. Oh uh, yeah, I played that game a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't play it. He wasn't in it for the Large story. Large sections of Caleb's memory have been excised <laughs> to make room for a, a Jack, a hardware Jack that he he's a courier for data. That's, uh, that's a. I'm sorry. It could be just some things were less important to him. He cared about making good grades and no, having friends. No, I played it a lot. It's just been a long time ago. That is one of the only Super Mario games I've beaten. Yeah. yeah. I played that one extensively, actually. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's very early. There isn't that much of a story to it, honestly. It's, it's a, just it's, you beat it and you wake up. Well, the whole premise, the, it's such a, I liked it because it was so different. And mm-hmm. obviously, we, as we all know, mm-hmm. it was ripped off from another video game it's entirely. Just, it's just, it was changed from a Japanese it video game. Yeah. Into I wouldn't a, say it was ripped off. It wasn't off. ripped off. It was but just yeah. changed for the North American market. Can we just say it was ripped off just so that I can... <laughs> so Nintendo can sue us? Would you call it a con? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Conning these kids. <laughs> I remember the music from it. it. had great music. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you guys are all fucking it all up on me. <laughs> I was going to bust a freestyle. So obviously, there. I remember the music yeah. from it. I don't remember the characters' names. <laughs> don't remember any. Birdo. Don't remember no. that the princess floated. Nope. Those ice levels were fucking hell. I hated the ice. Those were the worst levels. I liked the desert levels. I liked being oh, yeah. towed the sand. and going in you and dig, sand, yeah. dig for like an hour so and a fun. half trying to okay. dig I, in its way strategically. I, I, rem- I remember it now. Okay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> he remembers everybody. Super Mario 2. Uh, Ryan, I believe you have... Of, uh, committed yourself <laughs> to doing a, a thing whereby a, are you going to make a custom cocktail for every episode we do? Yeah, I <laughs> I have decided that um, uh, it's been a whole two episodes since we introduced a new segment, which was the in the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I decided that um, you know up to this point we've been teetotalers. I thought we might introduce drinking to the show. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know. I'm kind of scared. Yeah, <laughs> it's scary. It was kind of inspired by our episode 100 where our friend Haley, um, All Hail Megatron, made custom drinks for us that mm-hmm. we had. Mm-hmm. So I thought 
this is really just an excuse for me to work through this book that Caleb got me for my birthday one year, Jigger, Beaker, and Glass, hmm. um, which is like, a, it was written in the t- around the turn of the 20th century and published in like 1939, so parts of it are super racist. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's... <laughs> Read me, a, I want to hear a racist part no. of this book. I will. I will. Oh, it's a cocktail. Okay. It's not racist. True. It's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not, it's, so, it's like horribly casually racist. Like okay. it's. It's just like I will read you a section um, in in a second. When the porter asks if you want a drink, hand him your bag and then tell him to get you a drink. It's kind of like yeah, that. I was <laughs> say. I was about to say. There is actually I can just do it from memory. There's a section where uh, they're making a particular drink and it talks about how the drink is. Uh, prepared at this certain location, this certain um, bar, and um, the the secret to it oh, no. is that you have like twelve. Oh, I'll have to find the word. I can't remember the word they use. It's a word I've never heard before, but it indicates black bartenders. Mm-hmm. Um, there's twelve of them behind the bar, and each one of them has to shake the th- the drink for a minute and pass it to the next one. And I'm like, this is horrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is so horrible. However, though. <laughs> Oh, the, the show and tell. Oh no! I can just imagine bringing that t- idea, that concept, to a modern, you know, take the racism uh, out of it. Right? Take the racism out. Twelve out. bartenders. I mean, we live in a multicultural society. Also, I've never been to a bar that had twelve bartenders. No. Well, <laughs> but, but sure. we live in. A, but, so I assume if you do find that bar, you're going to have each bartender is going to represent a that's a different swatch of the. Uh, that's so the totally American a color rainbow. Wheel. <laughs> that's so totally a club drink. Like like uh, get, <laughs> get, get the staff in here, right? Line them. Up All and they have him do is shake it and have him dance. I think that would, they hate that guy who orders that every time he comes in. That was trying play, to get his minimums taken care of. That would play well in New Jersey. I feel like. Why? I don't know. Seems like they're garbage. <laughs> I don't understand that at all. <laughs> Very esoteric <laughs> shots taken in New Jersey. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I'll, so, I'll, what is our drink, Ryan? I, Sorry, I still I don't understand what that means. <laughs> I just feel. I guess I'm just thinking Jersey Shore. Like, those guys seems like they'd order a shit-ass oh, drink. okay. But those guys aren't going to... I will say that if you listeners want to make a drink recipe for us, we will probably try it. But don't be like, I want I want Ryan to drink Caleb's pee. Like, I don't... That's... Why do you assume they're going to do that? I don't know. I like to get in front well, of the might, problem. There might be one listener. I, I, <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah. I'm just relieved it's not the other way around. Yeah. Oh, you're drinking my pee? Yeah, no way. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be real salty. Ryan, you are experimental with your food. It's true. Uh, and I've tasted pee, but I like, you know. <laughs> Come on, guys. Let's get talking about Transformers. Okay. <laughs> I never no. thought I'd hear him say it. <laughs> Jesus. But, okay, Christ. so so this drink is quite pink, Ryan. What, what should, do we got here? We should take a picture of it. This is... This is the Chip Chase Creole Fizz. It's in honor of the introduction of one of my favorite characters, Chippeth Waterford Chase, which is not his name. But I, it's not, and he's not Creole, but it's alliterative. And this episode occurs during summer. We're recording this during Labor Day weekend, actually. And um, just a quick sidebar, that does remind me. My dad told me a Labor Day joke whenever I was a kid, before dad jokes was a term. Mm-hmm. His joke was... Um, if it's Labor Day, why is nobody working? That's a, that's a good dad joke. Yeah, I put that in one of my Herschel calendars. <laughs> I, I called Aaron this week with a, with a joke, with a dad joke. I don't know if it's a dad joke. It's a joke my dad told me. Okay. It's, a, it's a call-in joke. Not yeah. really a dad joke, just a call-in joke. It's a, it's a call-in joke and it's a call-in joke. Yeah, it's a phone joke. So, okay. So, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you, all right? Okay. Ring, ring. Hello. Hey. What's got a one-inch dick and hangs down? I don't know what a, a bat. What's got a What's got a ten-inch dick and hangs up? What? Then he hangs Click. up. Oh, it's classic. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Apparently, they did that to the, each other at the railroad a lot. Those good time Charlies. I guess it sounds <laughs> those, like those union workers. From what I gather, when he worked at the railroad, it was just a free for all of crazy fun. It sounds. Awful to me. It sounds like amazing. No, it just sounds like everybody's torturing each other. It, they did. I don't like it. Was it. Fun. I don't want it. <laughs> yeah. I don't like pranks. <laughs> Let's get back to the drink. Okay. Yes, okay. Sorry. Okay, so this is a fizz. Fizzes were made to be mid afternoon drinks consumed during lunch or as a quick pick me up whenever drinking was fun <laughs> and everybody wasn't so uptight about casual alcoholism at lunch yes. on a work day. Absolutely. I really miss the glory days of drinking. <laughs> they drink a lot at the railroad. 
<laughs> That's great because you don't have to steer. Yeah, the, the, there was a conductor that would get really juiced up on scotch, and he liked to leave late. When he had a route to St. Louis, he liked to leave late so that he could drive really fast Jesus Christ. To, to, catch, to catch up on scotch. The greatest generation. Yeah. They Luckily, the these guys are all just hauling things, not people. Yeah, but they cross people. Like, they cross. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not, Terrible. not an element of danger. Here, okay. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, I will read from the book for the recipe for this. Um, Which, again, is called? It's called, a, a, the, oh, I call it the Chip Chase Creole Fizz. Um, in the book, it is called just the Creole Fizz. Being a latter-day hot weather and milder variation of the original New, or New Orleans Silver Fizz and employing slow gin to lead its shy blush to the color scheme. Lyle Saxon gave us this one back in 1930 during a visit to York, New York, telling us about the acquisition of old French Creole House on Royal Street. Take either the Aziz Special or the New Orleans Fizz and substitute an equal amount of good imported slow gin and cutting cream down with a trifle. Some of the verbiage is impenetrable. Yeah. <laughs> Garnish with a sprig of fresh green mint, and that's all. I didn't have the mint. I should have brought the mint, but I didn't. So basically, it's one table or one teaspoon sugar, two jiggers of slow gin. Which, if you don't know what slow gin is, you're not a hundred years old. It's just gin with like this slow juice. Slow. Slow juice. <laughs> Slow is a, it's a stone fruit. I can just imagine the dude who made up this. What's a stone fruit? Like a plum with a, with, st with a, ah. like a, a big seed it's in the middle. a pit. They call yeah. it a pit. Yeah. Um, I can just imagine the guy who's like, Vinny, we're going to make a million dollars. I'm going to take this fruit nobody's heard of and just combine it with gin. That's all it is. Okay. It's just gin with this fruit juice. Yeah. Is Okay, the fruit juice is just uh, combined in there. It's not, you know, essenced or uh, infused. No, it's just mixed. Okay. <laughs> Right. Um, and then the juice of one lemon, a pony, which is one ounce of thick cream, uh, the ta a tablespoon of egg white, shake with cracked ice, pour, and add two to three dashes orange flower water, and fill with club soda, which I did not do. What about the orange flower water? <laughs> Let me get the club soda real quick. I have the orange oh. flower water. I had, so I had you, need to add, you need to add the soda I water to this? I have the soda right up okay. here. All right. This doesn't look very appetizing. I think it looks refreshing. It's It looks like pepto No, I... I mean, it's bright pink. That's okay. I'm, a, I'm I drink pink shit. Uh, it looks. I mean, it looks like it's gonna calm my stomach well, down, which is. If good. you don't want it, I'll take the. I'm I'll gonna take drink yours. it. Shut up. Why are you still whispering? Ryan's right here, <laughs> one the club soda. This looks really good, Ryan. It looks that way. <laughs> I don't know how it's gonna taste. Oh, you at haven't all. tried it. I have never. You made didn't it. experiment. I, with no, your I wanted it to come in fresh. Chemical. All right. Skills. All right, all right. Coming in. We are going to drink. All right, here we go. Here, cheers. cheers. Twenty-three skidoo, guys. All right, to, all right. to, to a what good one hundred and nine. Hmm. It's refreshing. It doesn't taste alcoholic. Yeah. It is quite nice. It does say from the book: serve immediately and drink soon thereafter, since no gin fizz gains virtue from even the briefest neglect. Yeah, drink it, drink it fast. <laughs> so pound it down, baby. Pound it down before you get behind the car. It tastes a little behind bit like wheel. melted and watered down, but yet still fizzy sherbet. Yep, it does. And it looks like that. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. ask our bartenders for these at uh, TFCon DC. Yeah. Hey, we're coming to TFCon DC. Be there and be square. Come That's see right. us. There's a certain tartness to it. Mm -hmm. like, uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, it's like, actually I, it's surprisingly good. I, it's better than I thought it would Ryan. be. I'm really excited now that you're going to be making drinks for us every episode here on out. Mm hmm. And because, we're, <laughs> because we're recording two today, that means we got another one on the The way. next one is a champagne cocktail. This is amazing. Um, and the, it, the nice thing is, is we're, you're going to have a, an audio doc. Document, you know, like you can, yeah, you can document this. You Absolutely. Can refer back to it. And the the slow gin, since it's mixed with, um, it's a liqueur, so since it's mixed with juice, that is why, like, fizzes are meant to be low in alcohol, like because that you consume them quickly, and so it's meant to be just like a, a berry. It's basically Benadryl. <laughs> right, and people like that. That one, you know, like people are like not just like back in the day, you were not going to be disappointed at a low alcohol drink like this because you know you're just going to go. And, drink more anyways yeah and nope. prohibition had just been lifted so everybody's like let's now it won't kill us anymore well done the chip chase the, the chip chase creole fizz well ryan that was a delicious drink i'm glad you enjoyed it thank Thanks, you for ryan. making it i mean it, it was by happenstance so don't take any credit for it you didn't experiment to try and make sure it was perfect or nope. anything. no i like that i like that we don't know until yeah. it's too late yeah come in blind yeah. <laughs> come in blind uh -huh. all right we got 
a truckload of news and shout outs Absolutely. today before we before we get into the op- episode proper. So uh, strap yourself in, <laughs> hang tight. <laughs> oh, hunker down, everybody. <laughs> Caleb's rubbing his face. Yeah. Do the opposite of what Daniel and the Autobots did as they crashed on Junkie on, which was strap in. Ah, great. Moving on. Uh, we've got a Patreon, guys. Did you know that? Yes. I did. And uh, it seems like listeners should know that. I mean, that seems like the goal. They should know that and perhaps contribute to it. Uh, We would be honored to receive your support. No matter the level of show enjoyment you have, there is a a Patreon level for you. Let's talk about the levels that we've got going on here real quick. Uh, We've got Look Out and Shout, Mm -hmm. which is our $2 level. And at this level, you will receive the Blessings of Primus, which, of course, is a shout-out during the show and on social media. You'll have access to the Notorious APDC group text, where all the hot gossip and passive aggression your Turbo Revan motor can handle will Mm -hmm. be accessible. And that's going to be a patron-only feed within Patreon. Uh, If we do virtual hangouts, not promising we will, but you will certainly get first in introduction to them and didn't mention this on patreon uh but if you you will also at the two dollar level be uh included in our hall of heroes which will be a site a place on our website where you are sweet permanently etched in as a as a donor to the cause unless so that's, you stop donating <laughs> that's the lookout and shout two dollar level uh, at the $5 level, dubious bargaining. This is everything from the previous tier, plus you'll get a personalized thank you card signed by us, uh, access to bonus audio and video material, as well as the APDC booty box, which is something that will put together, assemble uh, once a year, and it'll have some fun little items, trinkets, artwork, buttons, prints, things like that. Basically stuff that we want to make because we're all creators and and uh, you will get that. And I just, fun, 3D, collectible thing. I just got a 3D printer that I'm I'm getting the training wheels off of that and uh, it is, uh, you know, I, I've had some ideas of some fun things we could make for Love date, it. like podcast centric. Excellent. At the $10 a month level, we've got, you, you become a part of the iconic ghost entourage and that's everything from the previous tier uh inclusive of in your booty box you will have the apdc black card which basically just showcases your elite status within our you know our world maybe i could 3d print that maybe uh it also entitles you see us at a con it entitles you to one free drink purchased by the apdc of value of less than ten dollars or i'll kiss you on the mouth in an elevator. Mm-hmm. The place to do Love it. Love in an elevator. <laughs> Can't get out. No, no. <laughs> Wait for the door to close. Consensually. I will consensually kiss you. <laughs> That's right, but you'll feel like you've got to say yes because you're in a closed elevator. <laughs> oh, several, no. No, no, we can't do this. And uh, most importantly, though, you get a premium version of the APDC Booty Box Black Edition for your black card, uh, including items from the <clears throat> mini pack plus an additional premium item uh, such as a T-shirt, a limited edition art print, that kind of thing of a, a bigger size. So uh, I want to note that both of those benefits are only uh, accessible if we unlock our 25 patron goal. So uh, you should definitely spread the word if you're somebody donating at that level or looking forward to that particular piece of um, uh, incentive. Mm-hmm. Then, yeah, get people out there to sign up for it. We get 25 people. That's unlocked. We'll start production. Uh, and then the final level, the top tier, is the classic Sunbow wallet grab. And that is our 25 <laughs> Five dollar tier, it, it, that basically that gets you all the benefits we just spoke of. Plus, um, after six months of support at that tier, which by the way we also require that for the previous two tiers, six months of support to get your booty boxes, you get you get an eight and a half by eleven commish on Bristol board by yours truly, Mr. Ryan Jett. Mm, yes. So uh, that's the very cool benefit to that one. So, uh, so those are the tiers goals. One gotta, per year. Um, one yes, one per year. Thank you for calling that out. I wanted to add, um, Bro Sells has offered if you if a, if someone if a patron makes a one time at minimum two thousand mm-hmm. dollar contribution mm-hmm. that we will f- fly you in, mm-hmm. put you up at a Holiday Inn or something. And, and why not? Why not that uh, the Vandevort make it fancy? We need or a, University well, Plaza. Well, because we need a place where there's like a, a, a like it's got like a convention room. So okay. Stuff. All right. 
and uh, bro cells will come and, and lead a series of, of uh, clinics and presentations and, and get you oh like a business a business like, building yeah. yeah yeah train you on um, on how to how to market and sell bro cells mm -hmm. how you can sell bro cells to your friends oh, okay. and then you turn them over and have them start selling and talking about bro cells and contributing to them so it's it not a pyramid scheme no, no not yes yeah it is. <laughs> but but that's the bro sells way. <laughs> that's the tagline. And so, yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in there real great. quick. Mm -hmm. no, the, the, great. No, great incentive. $2,000 tier. We will not have that on uh, Patreon. You just got to know. You got to be in the know. You just got to DM us. Well, well, well and, and pay us. And then. And what is that Patreon uh, page? It is patreon.com slash apoddcast. I'm sure if you search for Autopod Decepticast, you will find it. Well... <laughs> well, hey, let's talk about goals real quick. We have two goals. We mentioned the 25 goal. The 25 goal, again, unlocks uh, the booty box um, incentive. And then at 50, we are going to uh, seek out some external resources to help in production just to allow us more opportunity to create more content, basically. Mm -hmm. Those are the two goals. 25, 50. Help us. Contribute. Make it happen. And we just launched mm -hmm. this, so like we definitely won't have this much of an extended talk about it in the in the next episode. We'll just mention it at the end and shit. Yes. So we just we just we just oh. did this and like honestly the response so far, we've, we've had it going for a week, has been amazing. Yes. Well, let's talk about the response because uh, we have an obligation to fulfill here. Absolutely. As part of uh, our, our, our Patreon duty to those who have, um, I guess, merged into this convoy of support that we're, that we're receiving. So let's, I want to start right at the very top. Uh, this is, I believe, in order of contribution, not in order of amount uh, donated, but in order of who did it who first. Who signed up? Who, who did and it? And I have to call out uh, at Robinus Prime, who before we even had a Patreon page, uh, started shipping us money via PayPal. So he did. Uh, when not changing nappies and pressing F nine on spreadsheet, uh, on spreadsheet singular. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there's one this, spreadsheet in his life. <laughs> yes, he's donating to the APDC coffers. So respect where due. He's the first to give us some of his hard-earned pounds sterling because he's British to the Shh. cause. I don't know why you were whispering it. <laughs> Shh. Nobody knows. <laughs> don't tell anyone. He's British. We had a revolution. <laughs> uh, not to take away from the honor of. Uh, being first to our first formal Patreon donor. Like, real quick. They're yeah, like, yeah. Wait, he was, was on it. They were hovering over the donation. Absolutely. <laughs> In fact, he sent us, because uh, uh, our previous episode came out, and I did have a bit about how our Patreon was live. At the time, it was not, because we had submitted it, and it took a couple of days to get approved, and he sent us a picture of, like, hey, where the shit is your page? Yes. <laughs> And who would that be? That, well, so that's Alpha Magnus, aka at Alpha Magnus yes. on Twitter, Etsy, Patreon, Instagram. He uh, great cosplay and customizer, uh, noted denier of business opportunity, uh, <laughs> as pitched by me, Aaron. Right, right. Yes. Noted, noted <laughs> denier of being involved at any in any way with uh, at one lonely con on Twitter as well. <laughs> that's right. He's not he associated. Not, he is not. Uh, anyway, but we're talking about Alpha Magnus. Uh, Ryan, by the way, I'm going to force you to do the 3D print of uh, mm -hmm. Rod Masterpiece Rodimus Prime. He also Prime, the said, face. like, this... I, thank you for... But this fucking asshole <laughs> was like, hey, I was going to print you guys something, but now that you got a 3D printer, he DM'd me and is like, you do it. <laughs> I'll send you the file. <laughs> That's hey, you gotta, he's teaching you to fish. That's right. <laughs> I guess it is true. He has helped me a, a ton with setting up the printer, like a bunch of like the problems he's had. Uh, he was like, here's how not to have those problems like up front. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Multi-talented wonder. Uh, so please check out uh, his Etsy page. Uh, he's got uh, some custom work on sale right now. He's been working on, uh, he's got rubber tires for uh, the War for Cybertron Ironhide that look very awesome. And I'm going to get my hands on them. I think he's going to make a slightly different set because I'm going to buy that mold, but it's going to be the War for Cybertron Crosshairs version of the mold that I buy. But um, so next up, uh, one of the O. 
G listeners to the Autopod Decepticast, yes. a chap that has been with us since the very beginning, and we got the pleasure of hearing his voice for the first time on episode 100. Mm-hmm. Um, that is Mr. Ernie Sexton, a.k.a. Skeeter112375 mm-hmm. on buddy. Twitter. We're lucky to have him on the squad, frankly, because I think he's a bigger Star Trek fan than he is a Transformers Fan. We can like both. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a bigger Star Trek fan than I am. Oh. <laughs> this is absolutely true. He has nothing to plug, that, that, but I'd like to but plug... But he does have an adorable doctrine. Uh, I'd like to plug him as just a super sweet, handsome guy, and I realize exactly... what you just said. <laughs> how that sounds right now. Yep. Uh, thank you again, Ernie. And moving on, we have Jeff Sadler, who is another super nice guy, and he is a guy in my family unit who just got turned on to the APDC. I am making all the innuendos. I know. I was like, you're, you might be horny. Episode. But uh, he didn't even know we were doing it. So basically, let's see. How can I break down this relationship in an uncomplicated way? I That's can't. That's not. Or my, my, no, my, your my wife's, sis, he's my wife's sister's ex-husband and father of my wife's daughter's niece. cousins. Good God. We'll call them nieces. Your wife's niece. <laughs> you just say wife's niece. But he's awesome, and um, he is in the depths of pharmacy school, so I hope this isn't tuition money that, is, <laughs> that he's sending me. But he would like me just to uh, remind the public to get their flu shots. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, uh, we'll, and vaccinations, please. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Great Stop guy. Stop the measles. Great guy, great wife, super cool kids, amazing family, and thank you for the dough, Jeff. Yep. Uh, next, we have Seattle's own. Mike Seibert, not affiliated with Cybertron.com. Now, who is this? Well, he's a creator, <laughs> producer, star of Mike Seibert Radio on all your favorite platforms. I listen on Stitcher. I uh, think I remember this guy. He yeah. bills himself lately as nobody's favorite Transformers adjacent. adjacent podcast. However, I think it's fair to say he's my favorite Transformers oh, adjacent podcast. Mine too. Uh, so peep his show. It's pop culture. It features independent artists, musicians, really creators of all types. He's been... Uh, doing a series of interviews with independent Transformers creators lately at um, TFCon Toronto, at Cybefest Northwest, and he had a really great interview with uh, Yoshi from Transmissions and Greg from Unfunny Nerd Tangent, who mm-hmm. are responsible for the Transformers reanimated, sort of unlicensed comic script series that builds on builds a bridge really between the the cartoon and the movie between seasons two yes. and and the and two thousand five basically where the movie is set. And uh, so shout outs within shout outs. I know yeah. <laughs> it's inception shout outs. <laughs> So, uh, a couple things to shout out for him. September 7th, he'll be recording live uh, from 3 to 4 at the Renton City, Washington Comic Con, a.k.a. RenCon. Which, will this be out September 7th? Uh, it'll be out September 9th. Well, so, go, get, go back in time and go check job. that out. <laughs> hey, good job, Mike. <laughs> that was an awesome yeah, job it was recording good. from that we, con. We enjoyed listening to uh, this. He'll also have a more more time sensitive. <laughs> uh, he has a table po- in Podcast Row during the Jet City Comic Show taking place, ten twenty six and ten twenty seven, which means he won't be with us at TFCon. That is very sad. Uh, so more on those events. Uh, I would say Written City Comic Con, but that's going to be gone. Uh, Jet City Comic Show dot com. However, check that out. And honestly, like I, I genuinely believe our podcast would not be at the level it is without Mike's help and support. And Absolutely like he, not. he has been very helpful and yeah. just giving us advice and also supporting us whenever we went to TFCon Chicago. And, and, frankly, okay. and he was and he helped with the Ron Friedman interview in TFCon LA. Yep. That's right. Now, frankly, I listen to his show just for, all the time for ways to try and make our show better from a pacing standpoint. Although I would argue pacing is not his strong point always. <laughs> and I mean that I mean that in a loving way. Oh, well, in the best way possible. Well, but uh, I wouldn't say pacing is our strong quality, point either by no, any, It's absolutely not. And I think tr- this very system. conversation is evidence of <laughs> Yeah, we've been recording for forty five minutes. Uh, okay, let's let's move on to uh, a name that sounds very familiar. Hmm. Ryan, have have you got any insight on Deborah Jett? She is my stepmother, which oh. I was. Vi- this is the most shocked. I think she was the second patron. Like honestly, oh, then I didn't do this in order. It okay. doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't um, really matter. But she, yeah, I, I now I'm concerned 
because I'm wondering, like, she gave us money, and I'm like, I don't know if she knows that it's monthly or if mm -hmm. it's just a one-time thing. Right. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell her. She probably um, doesn't care. But also, I, 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 I'm sure she doesn't listen to this, and I hope not, because on the last episode, I told an embarrassingly salacious story about my father's first wife in a sexual, <laughs> amateur pornography film. <laughs> yep. You only watched for 45 minutes. <laughs> and I did, and I... I Barely jerked off. This I barely is, came. This is horrible. <laughs> uh, this is so, absolutely horrible. <laughs> so, um, is there anything you'd like to uh, plug for, for Deborah Jett? Oh, God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just move on. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> All right. Finally on this list is, uh, quote, actual G.I. Joe expert at Serge Bomba on Twitter, a, a fanatic uh, of a certain brand of real American heroes who convinced us to cover, uh, <laughs> though in abbreviated fashion, G.I. Joe the movie. So while other Much to the chagrin of yeah. many of our listeners. So... Yeah, I well, liked it. I'm glad we did it. I'm glad we did it. Maggot of the moment. While while many listeners may despise his influence, <laughs> <laughs> we we love him, and not just because he's a top tier supporter. Um, he's gunning for that jet commission, baby. I'm, I, 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 let me try. No, no, no that's that perfect. Is. No, you leave that. Okay, here's the deal. I'm committed to limiting the number of babies that I use in an episode, and I want to do it a different way. So I, I noted to myself, when you say baby today, try and do it like Sammy Davis Jr. would do it. Yep. But he goes, he's more like, babe. Are these things that go around in your head all the Jesus time? Jesus Christ, it must be a circus in there. Yeah. There's also the Dennis Miller version. Babe. <laughs> <laughs> Follow Serge Bama, at Serge Bama, on Twitter. Uh, get into his mad world of humorous observations. He uh, puts out a lot of uh, very illegal knockoff toys <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, comic commentary. Now he's going to get arrested. Uh, talk about the most insane movies I've, I've never heard of. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Bamba, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very much. Rock. So those were our patron shout-outs. Mm-hmm. Uh, check that box for today. Uh, remember, uh, if you'd like your life condensed into a short paragraph <laughs> <laughs> and delivered by us with a note of thanks, please donate to Autopod Decepticast at Patreon. Awesome. Well, that's not the address at all. It's <laughs> patreon.com <laughs> slash apoddcast. Well, I just think if you search... You can, whatever. I don't know why you should give, give this. them the address. <laughs> I just don't Regardless. Understand. That's not the end of the shout outs, people. Uh, oh, God. Wait, we have a shout out for an iTunes reviewer. Oh. Uh, Darth Revon. So, pardon me, because it's Revon with an accent mark. And I know that that is a Star Wars reference. And I apologize because I don't know Star Wars pronunciations. Uh, Transformers is really my only nerd thing. And after that, it's like uh, Hunter S. Thompson novels. So you can tell I'm oh. definitely a very edgy, edgy 90s kid. <laughs> he uh, or she, because uh, gender is not specified, goes on to say, uh, what a Funny, entertaining podcast. Thank you for doing the More Than Meets the Eye episode by episode reviews. I love it and hope you continue. So as you have uh, no doubt seen, Darth, if I may be informal, be, uh, actually Darth is a title, if, as you've seen or listened, we are keeping it up, so I hope you are continuing to listen. Please, if you're on the Twitstagrams, reach out to us and uh, yep. give us a shout. ID yourself. Thank you. Uh, uh, contribute to our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, I also just wanted to do a special shout out to uh, Green Lantern HG on Twitter, who yeah. has been really a long time yeah. supporter. He's been around for, for, uh, for since practically the beginning. Yeah, he's been helping preach the APDC gospel. Spread and I just, the wanted, word. I just wanted to recognize that and uh, and and thank for that. All right, well, guys, let's talk about Transformers. Oh. What do you say? What? I guess. Okay, <laughs> here we go. All right, is anybody still listening? Last episode recap, uh, we introduced the concept of space bridges, uh, we introduced the concept of Bumblebee and Spike as bungling buddies, and most importantly, we reintroduced 
the loneliest Decepticon in the entire Legion, Shockwave. Mm-hmm. And that brings us to episode five, Roll For It, originally broadcast October 13th, 1984. This you guys is ready to get into this? One of my favorite yes. episodes because really? I had, I had, yeah, well, by virtue of the fact that somebody bought it for me on VHS. And so I had this and I had SOS Dinobots. And so those are my, like, by default, two favorite episodes. Um, and maybe the reason I have such an affinity for Prowl, mm-hmm. because he, he's featured pretty significantly in this episode, and uh, why I kept trying to shoehorn him into our Twitter post-it uh, thing, uh, a survey that, that I kept doing, and nobody cared about Prowl. We open up to what I would consider a very familiar scene in, in the Transformers lore to date, which is the Decepticons about to attack an Earth power facility. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's another hydroelectric facility. And in flight, uh, we see Starscream coming in. He reminds everybody that he's the leader of the Decepticons He gets now. his wish. You might recall that Megatron was sucked up into the space bridge. Starscream's the leader, and ultimately... He they they land at this facility and they order the crew to start pumping out Energon pillows. Mm-hmm. Who is he talking that? to? That dude on the mustachioed gentleman on I the like, phone. I like Mayday that part. Decepticons. Run for it! Mayday Decepticons, send help! Who the shit is he talking to? I don't know, but I noticed something on that shot. Like whoever uh, illustrated that did a perfect job because. The, the cord that hangs down, mm-hmm. it's all twisted up. It's it's Is twisted it? up That's like amazing. how, like, you know, back when they used to get twisted up, you have to hang them upside down to let them sure. unboil. Yeah, mm-hmm. I probably, if it were me, I would have taken the easy way out and just done, you know, a U-shaped coil loop. Yeah, no, they, but they, they went the extra mile. The I feel like, actually, the animation in this episode is pretty good. Like, it's, it's changeable, but a lot of it I really like. Hmm. Oh, you disagree? I, I, kinda, I don't love I, a lot of I, it, but I thought some of it early on, and it was uh, was not was subpar. But all right, I'll call it better. out when we get to it. All right. I, one thing: they're at a hydroelectric dam, and there are lots of oil drums there for no reason. They mm-hmm. love they love to mix energy. Metaphors. It could be any kind of drum. Like drums contain things other than oil. Well, these drums contain nothing, as we see when Starscream <laughs> fires upon them, and they just kind of shred to bits. Well, they're yeah. oxygen drums. <laughs> So, well, if they were oxygen drums, they'd explode like a bomb. But so they're just. Also, here we are, like right, uh, one twenty-eight, and this continues throughout the episode. The the noses on the Transformers are drawn super large in yeah. this episode. They're very Romanesque. It's just weird. It's 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 a, it's like it's very strange. Yeah, they, they almost look like Muppets. It looks like it was stung by a cyber bee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a worse comment than that later in the uh, episode, actually. No, oh, I don't even know. Or what is it in the next about. episode? Oh, it's a piece of oil cake. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually I do have that. In my notes. I have that written down. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to imagine how that would taste. <laughs> so, oh. Oil cake is actually a thing. But I digress. Okay. At this point, uh, Soundwave is ejecting fully energized. Uh, Energon cubes. cubes from his chest. It's an animation error. I, I guess that phone call was the Autobots because they show up immediately into the contact mm-hmm. on into the conflict zone. You've got Prime, Cliff Jumper, Brawn. They're your friendly neighborhood Decepticon records. Yeah, like that's an homage to like the Spider Man, your friendly neighborhood Spider Man. I think, but also I wonder if that has anything to do with like the Wreckers later. I don't think he meant it as an Autobot subgroup of kick-ass no. individuals. No, but I wonder but, if that's where they take it. But from. I wonder if that's where they take it from. So anybody that knows, the, I think the British Marvel comics is where that s- group originated. So if you know that that's inspired by this comment, let us know. Cliff Jumper, here, here's a um, another common scene we're seeing is Cliff Jumper just jumping into the action mm-hmm. and then getting his ass kicked right mm-hmm. away. He's very. Ineffective. I do love how he hits Braun, and Braun is just like standing there, like does, it doesn't even. Move he hits him. Braun, bounces to the floor. Braun is so powerful that it doesn't even phase him. Starscream, he's about to crush them with uh, what I guess is a, a turbine. It looks like a generator, yeah, an, inter- an energy yeah, those generator. Are heavy. <laughs> <laughs> they are heavy. I do love this because in just a second, you rarely see Starscream like square off with Prime, and I really like it. Like yeah. I really Actually, enjoyed it. He, and he, he, I think Starscream holds his own really well. Like he, like Optimus runs up and uh, Starscream just 
Oh, wait, that's the next episode. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> I do feel like Starscream in this is punching above, definitely punching above his weight class, but I just, I enjoyed seeing it. He's about to crush with the turbine. Prime intervenes, causing the turbine or whatever it is to tumble into the Energon cube. It's like, I love the line where he goes, Stop! <laughs> So these energon cubes, they explode, and that basically creates cause for the Decepticons to retreat, which Soundwave is the one that makes that command, though he is... Uh, not in the fight at all. <laughs> and, and not the leader. It seems like that would be Starscream's call, but Starscream yeah. has no problem fulfilling that. We see an iconic shot of Starscream. It's very cool the way he kind of... Elbows Prime out of the way. I do love that where he says, you'll pay for this Prime. And I'm glad you paused it here also where he flies in front of a rainbow at the the falls, which is an interesting detail. And I think we just call this the the Gay Pride episode. Yeah, I like the shot here also where, um, and I've seen this in GIFs before, where Soundway like... It's really weird. Runs out of the building. Yeah. It's then, very it strange. It runs through that net. Yeah. I don't get it's it. It's like he's being chased by bees or something. <laughs> yes. It's very silly. And and what is this badminton court doing yeah, at this it. facility anyway? I why why, why is that random there? volleyball? <laughs> so Blue Streak and Prowl at this point. Who are here now, I guess. <laughs> they 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 transform Ooh. and uh, chase after the Decepticons here. Um, Soundwave gets knocked from behind. Another very silly moment. It's, it's really a, silly. It's actually animated fairly well, but Soundwave gets knocked into the air, he transforms into his tape player, Starscream flies in, Well, because Starscream says... Transform, you fool! (laughs) Yes. Uh, Then, Blue Streak shoots them with some sort of uh, shock beam Mm -hmm. that I guess causes disruption in their mechanics, but mostly it just causes their giant jet noses to just droop. I kind of like that. I like that detail, where it looks like they're just fucked up. And it's kind of like their whole thing droops and like their noses are all... I think that those that drooping was they that was drawn based well that's super droopy there yeah <laughs> there were there were jets made like that that kind of had so it was like someone was illustrating it based off of a slightly different are you thinking jet of model. the Concorde? Uh, no, there was and I can't give you specifics, but there were some fighter jets that have a slightly drooped nose, and I think the illustrator was basing his drawings of those guys off of different jets than what they're normally portrayed as. I think you're right about that. I think I've read some tidbits about how hmm. that scene was inspired by yeah those are. Those jet. are sl- slightly different jets than what you normally see them illustrated as. They're a little, they're a little thinner and longer and sleeker and have that droop nose. Let's go to Cybertron for Yay. a second here, everybody, because it, it turns out that Megatron lives. He decides to check in on what's up with Earth. Don't act so pleased. <laughs> <laughs> He's able to contact them intergalactically with no time lag in reception nope. here. None of these robots have seen Interstellar, apparently. I don't recommend anybody does. Well, well, I think get it's a, the fuck. I think it's a good movie. Yeah. I hated it. Okay, it's in well, the seventies on Roddy T's. T- tomato, tomato. tomato. <laughs> anyway, apparently everybody needs to continue onward with some previously established plan to attack uh, a laboratory that's developing anti an antimatter formula. Oh and, God. And, and first. Though, Sun- Thunder and Starscream, Thundercracker and Starscream, rather. <laughs> Thunderscream. They need to repair each other. Or repair themselves, rather. And they need to be quick about it. I want to see them repair each other. <laughs> <laughs> they, Wait, where, where is uh, Skywarp? What's he doing? <laughs> Warping, man. <laughs> He's just chilling. <laughs> They're commanded to meet Megatron in the desert in five million astroseconds. Uh, billion. Five yeah. Billion astroseconds. Megatron hops in the space well, bridge and like, heads to Earth. No problems. I actually t- spent too much time trying to figure out how many minutes five billion astroseconds is. First of all, that is a crazy measure. That's like trying to measure like normal daily temperatures in Kelvin. Yeah, what? Just a brief. Like, that's why we have higher segmented. Yeah, numbers. it's so stupid. Like, <laughs> so the human system of numbering is more advanced than the Cybertron. Well, system. it would be like okay, I actually do have a note here: eighty degrees Fahrenheit, twenty-seven degrees Celsius would be three hundred Kelvin. Like, that, and that's a low. It example. is, and this is in the billions. Um, according to the calculation based on our previous episode, transport to oblivion. In the script, it says one hundred and eighty-three minutes equals three thousand astroseconds, which was a unit of time mm-hmm. in the last one, which is about three hours. 
So, five fucking billion astroseconds. I tried to do the math, and I'm terrible at math. I got like seven different answers. But I think, I think a thousand astroseconds is 5.5 minutes. So, five billion astroseconds is about five days. It sounds like the Decepticons just don't know how to divide. It see, or it also seems... That's it. <laughs> That's it. It also seems like maybe the writers were just like, didn't give a shit about oh, the no. scale. Big number plus made up metric system <laughs> yeah. equals, equals awesome. Awesome, yeah. <laughs> I spent like 40 minutes doing this. Oh my God. The writers, meanwhile, just threw it out This their is ass. why we do it every two weeks, because the research on these episodes is stupid. Uh, okay, so Megatron, he lands on Earth. He's greeted by his uh, good buddy Laserbeak. I love every time Laserbeak lands on Megatron's arm. It's so awesome. It's a nice touch. Yeah, it's great. You've also got Rumble, and you can tell that he knows he's up to something good because you've got that eye flash. And situation. he says excellent, which if you're playing our drinking game, you have to drink because oh, Megatron said shit. excellent. I'm out of rum. Oh, no. By sheer coincidence, Bumblebee and Spike... Uh, and, and another new Earth kid, Chip, are, are <laughs> I arriving. Love Chip Chase. Are, they're arriving at the very antimatter facility that, of course, the Decepticons were just talking about. <laughs> number seven. Yes, I <laughs> love that the, the guard pushes number seven, and that's what opens the gate on the scientific calculator that is the the pass key. Was like, like a multiply it. and divide on there? Instead? It had a square root, also. <laughs> It's just a calculator. <laughs> and um, I d it is interesting because this guard, I don't know who does the voice, but he has a southern accent, which oh, yeah. is pretty rare. Yeah. I've I, I never seen I never met an Autobot before. Autobot before. <laughs> I'm co consciously making him a southern bell. He's, but a, he's a gentleman. Yeah. I never met an Autobot before. He's, he's, uh, <laughs> we do, I think, need to briefly speak on Bumblebee's compliance with the Americans with Disabilities yeah. Act. Uh, he He's got a ramp. manages to just yep. yeah, have a ramp in his car as opposed to an extra seat. Bumblebee, at this point, he likes to show off to Earth folk, and he, when when saying it's you know it's good to see you, Spack and Chip, uh, Bumblebee's like, well, what about me? Chip, Spack, great to see you guys. No kind words from me? <laughs> wow, I've never met an Autobot before. Now let me get you through our security doors. And that's where the line that we've been saying was... I've insane. never met an Autobot before. before. <laughs> and also, it's called Robots in Disguise, Bumblebee. Why you gotta be so show-off? Well, you know, he, he needs to get his credit once in a while. So it seems Chip is a VIP mm -hmm. at this facility here. And Dr. Alcazar, uh, he wants to give Chip home internet access to these mainframes. Well, yeah. Which, like, Via an AOL diskette. Yeah. Which also... AOL, not even AOL. AOL was on CDs. Like, it's a floppy That's disk. True. It's a five-inch floppy disk, which also... I bet you they had AOL on the little, uh, the little tiny hard, like hard, the, hard well, disks. The mini disks. And Aaron, yeah. before we even get to... Wait. Before I, we, I do have things a little bit out of order here, because... Um, are you referring to the reflector thing? Yes. So, uh, yes, as they're walking into the building, reflector is spying... And the first time he's of actual use. Yeah, and and he is uh, getting the password to access the building, and he Even goes off. Even though spoiler, it's not the same later. He he goes off to to report to his leadership. Though. And this is where I say I like the animation because the leg the, when they jump up, the legs are really stretched out. I like the sketchiness of it, the the interesting angles. I thought it was fun. Yeah, that is cool. The drawings aren't great, but I like the ideas behind. Yeah, the, the dynamics, the, of it. the the proportions, and and this is also where Reflector says <laughs> yes, that, uh, yes. Get, taking over this facility is going to be a. Which uh, Chris Lana does the voice for Reflector. A piece of oil cake, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought you said a piece of auto cake for some reason. No, I, I don't think I did. I we don't. didn't. A good thing this isn't being recorded so we can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way of proving it. I guess what I wanted to get into briefly is just the there is a real lack. Uh, this is a serious facility with a top secret antimatter formula. Yeah, Chip Chase is involved, but they're gonna just let him bring his friend and sure. a, and an alien from another planet. And the password to get him on. the gate is seven. Yeah, you use a calculator <laughs> to open the door. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, there's just not. It just seems weird. The lack of security. Sure. But that's okay. They are they are in the building. They they make the exchange I spoke of early in earlier in that the doctor hands Chip a Doctor Alcazar, a, yeah, a, a diskette. And it was not a diskette, it's a disc. A yes. floppy disk, a five yeah. inch floppy disk. Old which school. Aaron has accused me of talking down to our younger listeners, but this is my time to explain what that is. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is uh, like, I, it has a capacity of 1.2 megabytes, <laughs> which is like about a middling range of a JPEG image. Also, it ejects backwards. So apparently, the, <laughs> the lab computer reads floppy disks in reverse. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, I genuinely, younger people genuinely do not know that, like, the save icon on, like, Microsoft Word and Excel, that's a 3.5 inch floppy disk. Right. The hard version of the floppy. Yep. The hard floppy. Also, mm-hmm. and we've gone ahead, but I love Bumblebee's pink seats. Basically, Dr. Alcazar is giving him the, uh, the, the, like, nascent internet dial up program to connect to Betsy Brainiac here. I do like the drawings of Chip as he's receiving the disc. Mm-hmm. Those are very, those are very cool, well rendered, and the way he blinks pink. in surprise is very cool. Oh, yeah, that is a pink seat. I'll be darned. Super pink, hot pink. Yeah. yeah what are we at? Like six, eighteen, six minutes, eighteen seconds. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's time for these guys to go back to Chip's house, drop drop him off, but for. What we'll discover is seemingly no reason at all. Laserbeak attacks, <laughs> attacks them. Bumblebee, Spike, and Chip. They they duck into a parking garage, but the damage is done in that the good guys are now tipped off that the bad guys have interest in this facility. Well, also, though, we miss a bunch of, like, in- animation here. Like, it's just keyframe animation. Yeah, I saw Like, that. there's a bunch of, of, of in like animation in between that's just not there. Yeah, also, it's like instantly the building is... Damaged. Yeah, when Laserbeak shoots right. the parking garage, it just instantly is damaged. There was some cool sequences there with animated backgrounds and camera zooms that were. I all did also love, done. love the look of the lasers that Laserbeak shoots. They're very cool. They're very they're 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 like um, movie level cool. Right. So we go back to they got away. <laughs> we go back to Megatron. It's. Hilarious how Megatron knows that B and the kids have been tipped off, and then you're like, "Why'd you send Laserbeak in the first place?" But also, like, he understands Laserbeak's tiny squawk to mean they got away. <laughs> the plan to attack the lab has now got to be accelerated due to the fact that they know the Autobots are soon going to get involved in this whole thing. So many things. No need to wait for Starscream. Chip is going to go home and let Doctor Alcazar know via his computer. Why don't just call him? Just call him on the phone. Does he have a phone? He has a phone because it's right next to his computer because otherwise he can't dial up. Does Dr. Alcazar have a phone? You're saying that lab doesn't have a phone? It has to have a phone if you're connected to the internet. I mean, I guess that would be the only way they could be connected to the internet back here at this point, right? Of course. I suppose. They want like an I do also an 80s we went, broadband. I do also love the the glowing of behind their feet when the Decepticons are flying. Bumblebee contacts Prowl and Blue Streak, but they're on the chase for the Seekers what do you and mean Soundwave. You can't come. Who and and the Seekers and Soundwave are foraging for parts for repair. So mm-hmm. they attack them. They being Prowl and Blue Streak attack them and are immediately overwhelmed. It really by seems the like they bit off more than they could chew. <laughs> and they didn't have to attack. They were just told to follow them. Like, yeah. <laughs> and they also just stand there while Starscream shoots the shit out of them. Mm-hmm. Ravages released, and they are cornered. Starscream shoots blasts. Prowl. I do like seeing them as brothers next to each other. You don't get much of Blue Streak on this show. You really don't, but he play uh, he plays more early on than I thought. Back from commercial, we've got Megatron and the team. They land at the antimatter facility. They get in easily with the code. Well, now, are we to believe they murdered the security guard? That's why I had that note, too. Did they just fucking kill the guard? Also, so many, like, unlimited energy is almost mine, is what Megatron says, and then there's a weird-ass laugh after it, which I think is rumble, but it's, again, there's no filter on it. So it just sounds like a, a weird man. Also, Reflector enters 
the code four nine three, and originally it was two nine five. So <laughs> I couldn't. I think that, that right. I'm thinking the facility probably just has it like. The way you get security access is just push three buttons. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I also, we've now paused it. Um, I can't. 821. 821, where Chip Chase has gone to all the universities. He went right. to USC, Pierce, and CS. CS. San? Sidden. Central. Whatever. And one that we can't see. I think he's gone to none of the universities because isn't he in high school? What? These are well, just maybe he's just fans of those schools. Like those I are think, all of his. Those are all the schools he's thinking about applying for. I think no. My I think that he was like a Doogie Howser where he's already graduated from school. Like he's so smart that he's he's already got his degrees. Well, well if he was, I feel like that's fan fiction, but that's okay. Yeah. Of course it is because it's not. There's no canon came to your, tell us. Came from your head. The oh. other the other thing that is weird to me about the Decepticons needing. A code to get into the building. I have they just too. walk through buildings. Yeah, I have this note too. I said, I mean, I love the time they take to break in instead of just walking through the wall right. like they do that's, every other yeah, time. That's, yeah, that's what they always do. And, and that's what I think we see Prime do a little bit later. Mm-hmm. Chip gets his message to Dr. Alcazar just in time for Dr. Alcazar to erase do nothing it. nothing about it. <laughs> well, he erases it before the Decepticons can just suck it out of the hard drive and Megatron has te- can t- just tell that Alcazar has shipped the whole formula to somebody else he can examine it he like can scan he it he does with like his this hand. weird yeah he touches it with his hand and then like there's this blue glow he lies he uploaded the formula to someone I don't know who but I soon will I think it's the first time we hear him refer to humans as flesh creatures which I love Nothing about flesh? You don't like the flesh creatures? <laughs> I love it. No, All right. Cool. Good observation. Flesh creatures. The, <laughs> so we know that this formula is going to Chip Chase. Megatron's just like, he doesn't know where it's going. Sure. But he says, let this human go. We, we seek, seek another. another. Because, you know, why? I mean, they would never just torture this guy or hang on to him for leverage somewhere else. They're real cash about, like, Megatron's always, like, kill the human, but then just, like, doesn't... They're really casual about not killing the human. <laughs> right. We go back to the Air Force base at this point. Prowl and Blue Streak are having a tough time. Prowl gets a shot with a ray that has the effect of an ether bender. And as we know, there's nothing more helpless and irresponsible than a man in the depths of an ether binge. <laughs> Prowl- I felt like 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 Soundwave shooting him was like he he was upset that Prowl had shot Ravage. That's war, man. And that this is pretty sophisticated for the time where Prowl is down, his battle computer is down. This is Autobot Prowl calling. I need help badly. My battle computer is down. Do you read me? An Autobot? Prowl? This is Chip Chase. Which, this is before the time where the internet, the internet existed, but, like, most people didn't, like, the public didn't know necessarily about it. And so whoever, I I didn't even look at who wrote this, but, like, this is a pretty sophisticated idea that is actually real, where he, like, uh, uh, Prowl connects with the computer and he has to connect with, he connects with Chip Chase. It connects to the phone. Yeah. Which then connects to the computer. Yeah, through the modem. I think in probably certain industries you knew about this, and I would imagine entertainment was one of those industries because you had a situation, and, and faxes had been around. It'd be faxing. You had a situation where if you were working remotely and had dead journalists, people like that, that had to get their information over to a, a publishing house or whatever, somebody, yeah. Sure. Sure. So but I would guess TV writers would know about it. I don't know. Well, well, somebody knew about it. <laughs> I'm just at least one, one TV writer knew about it. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. As we said, Prowl, he loses control of himself. He hooks up to a network. It just so happens that Chip Chase is there to see that Prowl is hooked up to the network and takes control. And with a simple keyboard, Chip is able to maneuver Prowl better than Prowl can maneuver himself. He's flipping, dodging lasers, ultimately helping Prowl steer a plane towards the Decepticons and fire its rockets at them. So you, to recap, Chip is controlling a jet by controlling Prowl. Yes. And I'll have to hand it to the riders he has the abilities to uh, make something function better than itself can function, even though he is limited in his own physical abilities. Well, 
And I think I have this note later, but I like uh, what I really enjoy about Chip Chase, in addition to being like, I really like the character, they never like um, specifically call out that he's, you know, disabled. They, they do just, say that he rolled for broke. I don't think that's, I don't think roll for broke is a term, though. I understand, but it's an interesting wordplay. I don't think it is. I don't think it's in reference to the fact he's in a wheelchair. You think you just think that's completely coincidental? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that I just what I really like is that I don't feel like they specifically call out that he is. uh, And so the title of the episode is called "Roll for It," and that's a coincidence. I don't know. This is dubious. I feel like it's it's intentional. Oh, I didn't get that at all. I thought they were addressing his disability. But that it's he's overcoming it by demonstrating certain things. Well, whether or not it is that is over, meant to yeah. be, it's not overt. It's not specific. They never call out that. And in the next episode, there is a line he uses about being disabled. But I again, it's not overt. Oh yeah, I like the way that they're not like really super hitting it on the nose. Exa- but, yes, but I do- and I feel like that would be an easy go to. And I feel like sure. in a lot of Ch- especially children's programming at the time, that would have been a subject sure. that they specific. I just feel yeah. like they treat him as another person, Yo, not something right. other. Absolutely. He's just doing his thing. Yeah, absolutely. But I do think that they're they're showing they're demonstrating things with uh, this episode and the next. That Maybe regardless of his disability. He is demonstrating that he is an asset. Of course, mm-hmm. of course. And maybe you're right. Maybe it is like subtle, but like if it's subtle, like why? I guess it, only adults would get it if it's that subtle. All right. Well, I think we're getting. All, I mean, I'm just back to what I was saying. I think that this example of of Chip controlling what's his name, uh, uh, Prowl, Prowl, and then also controlling the jet is is a way of you know him. Demonstrating himself as an asset, regardless of a disability, right. and I, I think that comes into play the next episode with the acid rain as well. Yes, spoiler. I do. <laughs> I, do ha- I do feel, and I know it's not that big of a deal. That, that roll for it, and they say roll for broke. I think those are intentional uh, wordplay. Um, I do like this part where you pause now, where the Decepticons are retreating after Prowl shot, like controlled the jet, shot missiles at them. Mm-hmm. Um, we're at eleven oh one, and I, I really enjoy the part where uh, Soundwave takes the time to pause and call for Ravage, and Ravage uh, injects, and then they escape. That's his homie. Yeah, I have. Gotta take care. Of him. It's also because Ravage looks like a like a cat. That I'm like, I feel I, I have feelings for him. <sighs> we get it, Ryan. <laughs> Do we? Here's the big old softy. All right, we are <laughs> back at the Decepticon headquarters. Mm-hmm. Megatron has determined where the formula was transmitted. They, the Seekers land in the street right in front of Chip's house. Ravage busts in the room just in time to see Chip tear up his AOL disc Which, right like, after he goddamn memorized it. He memorized it. Also, Chip Chase is the strongest man in the world because... If you can tear up a five-inch floppy like that, have you? That's super powerful plastic. Like, there's no way you. I don't believe anyone in the human world could even do that. My question in regards to that is: is the information? Why was it even transmitted to that floppy? Couldn't it have just been transmitted directly to the computer's hard drive? Shouldn't he be taking a baseball bat to his computer? Hmm. Because I thought, yeah, because that floppy was just to communicate with Betsy that, Brainiac. I'm assuming that floppy had with some... who? <laughs> Betsy Brainiac's the name. Of, <laughs> Betsy Brainiac is the name of the computer at the lab. I don't know oh, if it's the name of the computer at the lab. I feel like the Doctor Alcazar just offhandedly called the computer that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, that's true. He just says it's that's just AOL software. It bro. doesn't. It does. <laughs> I don't know why you keep saying AOL. Uh, There's no. I don't think AOL existed on five inch floppies. Guys, I bet you it did. I was on AOL before it was the, like CD ROMs were a thing. <laughs> Kid, you're rich. <laughs> no, I, I was at friends' houses. No, so it wasn't even yours at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you don't know how they acquired it. Well, they didn't do it on a CD ROM. I know that much. I do you. You could down you could download the Cheers theme song. You'd wait three days to get it. And I know of an audio file. It's like fucking me waiting for tits, just at a twenty eight k download rate. The point is, why did he put it on that floppy? It seems like that'd just be extra time. Okay, I've got the formula. Now put it on the also the floppy drive. Like Chip knows who Ravage is, and then I'm sure when, that Spikes filled him in. They're buds. Whenever they punch, whenever Ravage punches him back through the front window, the Door is auto fixed. 
Oh, is it? I yeah. It. <laughs> Ravage goes through the door, punches through the front window, and the door is fixed again. It's not a big deal. Go I'm ahead. sorry, one more thing. Whenever Ravage comes back, uh, Soundwave says, Excellent, Ravage, but it's in like a Dr. Claw voice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, at that moment they forgot to add the filter mm -hmm. onto it. Excellent, Ravage. Perfect. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Soundwave, Soundwave and the Decepticons kidnap Chip, take him back to the to the antimatter base as the Autobots approach and transform <sighs> for action. Guys, Optimus Prime has a plan. It's yeah. We get to see Hound and Mirage do their thing in the. St most ass way possible. <laughs> Let's get back to that in a second. I've, okay. got, I've got a piece All right. on that. All right. M meanwhile, Soundwave has the ability to extract the entire formula from Chip's brain, mm -hmm. and and that's what he does. It's and a really cool angle too. I like the I like the illustration where Soundwave is draining Trip Chip's brain. Um, it's it's a pretty dy like well, even yeah where he's hunched over. That was really nice. What I don't like is the Megatron's head. Yeah, Megatron's head at in this about, whole scene is bad. At about twelve forty-seven, yeah, it gets worse. Yeah, it's gonna get worse from in a far. This away angle shot. right here, oh, okay. where like he said, information extracted. You've got it's a chip cool. in the foreground. Megatron or Soundwave's giant hands in the background. We can see that his hand transformation is kind of recessed a little bit mm -hmm. from his. Cuffs. I feel like kind of cool. Also, and this episode is more anime animation style, especially on Chip Chase, who has very large eyes and very mm -hmm. dynamic expressions. Very blue. He's like this beautiful. fucking head on Megatron. Yeah, at the 13 mark, we've got just an insufferable. <laughs> it's Especially so they, bad. They decide to zoom in on it. And also his diaper is exceptionally <laughs> huge as well. Well, listen, incontinence is nothing to sneeze at, to mix metaphors. Prime, at this point, has relayed his plan to the team, but where are his key players? Turns out Mirage and Hound were there the whole time, just jacking just around dicks. with their <laughs> yeah. special abilities and hol their invisibility and holographic abilities. But it's time to begin the project, which has been creatively titled Antimatter. And I think uh, this would be a good point to... Uh, or at least where I was talking about previously, to play the segment where Prime, where Prime goes... Where are they? And then they reveal themselves, and he just goes, Where's Mirage? Sorry, Chief. I was just getting ready. Uh, so were, was we. I, that is me and my two uh, holographic twins. Fine. <laughs> Hound and Mirage, at this point, use their abilities to confuse Rumble... Ugh. And sneak Who's into the, the base. dumbest Decepticon that's ever been? They they should never leave him on on. Watch also, maybe. Hound become or Mirage becomes a rock. rock. Hound becomes a rock. Why not be a tumbleweed? Rocks don't just roll around. Like yeah. it's so dumb. Yeah. It's so dumb. I, and then they they tr they become visible before running yeah, into them. They're idiots. It's so. But I mean, again, thankfully they're dealing with Rumble, like, and Mirage can't help but fuck with him. What's that? Good question. Who said that? There's no one here. I must have static in my rectifiers. Now that's the smartest thing you've said all day. Really? Hey, what's going on? Like Mirage yeah. fucking with him, yeah. With Rumble, Seems like that could give away the whole plan. <laughs> As he goes in, what's going on? They're totally gaslighting him. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I like it. We're back in the facility. Soundwave activates the the master computer, and antimatter is created. Oh, Full God. energon cubes are being jacked up with yeah, antimatter. It's awesome. I got a whole thing about how I won't I, go I knew into you, it. I knew you would, which is why I didn't go into it, and you're smarter about. I'll it just anyway. do it fast. I won't go into it in depth, but this is not how antimatter works at all. Like, just go read about electrons and positrons. Sure. But also, as soon as Megatron puts it in his body or and or fires it, he would have vapor. Let me put it this Any way. Any touching of it. Yes. At yes. all. Anytime matter, like, matter cannot be created or destroyed is not really true. Whenever a positron and an electron touch each other, they're both annihilated and it's completely transformed into energy. I thought it was energy couldn't be created or destroyed. Well, energy and mass are interchangeable. Okay. I have so, a question. Yeah. 
can anything that we're seeing going on right now <laughs> really happen that way? I hate it when you do this, where you're like, you question the whole, you're, you're whenever you're like, you can take it down to like a child, like it's a children's TV show, but that's the only way we can review I, it. Sure, I understand. I just, yeah, I get it. It's just like we're talking like 15 minutes about tearing up a floppy disk, and then I'm just like, okay. Like, what, do you want, do you, what do you want me to do? I know, it's true. Keep going. Uh, just to finish, like you've made it so much longer than it was gonna be. <laughs> just, I don't even remember where I was. Anyway, like two kilogram or like a kilogram of antimatter touching a kilogram of matter is would be the, the explosion would be larger than the largest thermonuclear device we've ever created. Nice. So, could you even contain antimatter in a, like the way like they've got antimatter Not in like a tube that. here and are just. Okay. It, it only exists for brief periods because of the. You fact could only that, contain it if your container was made of antimatter. Well, it can usually naturally made. It's made of radioactive decay. It can be made in like the CERN, like the the particle accelerator, but it only exists for brief like nanoseconds of time. I'm not confused at all. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hound and Mirage continue to use their special abilities to confuse the Decepticons on the inside of the facility as the as the other Decepticons try and uh, gather this antimatter. Uh, B Hound, Spike Mirage, they 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 they've snuck that is in. That's pretty cool. Where they, they save where Chip. Megatron shoots at Hound, mm -hmm. and then they and then they jet out of there. Is this the first time we see a transform like a, an Autobot transform around a human? Because B transforms around um, oh, wow. yeah. Chip and Spike. I, don't I think know. that's perhaps. the first time. This is also the first time, perhaps, that we see Starscream fire his null ray From as, his if fist. It's, as if it's a pistol. Mm -hmm. And then we get this weird, like, tunnel where they go down, which made me kind of think of, like, um, the Contra tunnel. He drives <laughs> up the stairs. <laughs> yeah, they all drive up the stairs. When he transforms over them, it looks a little bit like he's shoving them up his asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I like this shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great Whoa. shot. The contra shot. Then they end up. They break through the glass that is also auto repairing yes. because the glass is they, fixed. They launch into the air outside of the facility. Then Optimus Prime sneaks uh, Ratchet, Sunstreaker, Prowl, Jazz, Blue Streak into the base mm -hmm. um, inside of his trailer. Uh, trailer. And by sneaking, what I mean is he just drives straight through, <laughs> straight the, through the, the wall. The wall. I'm assuming injuring Rumble in the process, who is stationed on top of that wall. He releases that crew. I love this transformation of Sunstreaker, where he transforms on the fly. Yeah, and his his front of it just becomes his feet, and it's all just mm -hmm. sliding it's along so the awesome. floor. Well, they they bust through the walls as Transformers tend to do, and are greeted by Megatron, who has a an antimatter energon cube, mm -hmm. which he chucks at them, and there is a an giant enormous explosion. explosion. Yes, it does look like I mean the lights, whole state lights up the whole sky. I have a note for that. It's, holy shit, that's a big explosion. <laughs> That's a good note. Yeah. It is quite large. And that's when we go to commercial. Where we see the, the lab is slightly damaged. <laughs> yeah, we return. The Autobots, they walk out <laughs> of the decimated facility. They're basically like, well, that hurt. We kind of need to recoup a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's about it. And the facility itself is completely intact, just a little bit of smoke. Back in the facility, somehow, the Decepticons are fine. It's like yeah, nothing that's happened. true. Yeah. Like they were right there. Like how did that supposed to work? And uh, they know that the opportunity is theirs to take a second shot at the Autobots while they're down. So we transition back to Autobot headquarters. The good guys are home. Ratchet is already there, which is yeah. quite weird because we clearly saw him in the scenes back at the Animator facility. I'll just chalk it up. It's very rare that we see animation errors, and <laughs> continuity issues. I mean, yeah, they just must have had an off day. Mm. This one time. Wheeljack, Spike, and Chip, they team up to work on a project <laughs> that will presumably help out this whole current situation. I do. Uh, Chip was driving. Chip was driving there, by the way. Yeah, he does sit in the in the driver's seat. I do love uh the I think Chris Lotta also has like fully fleshed out Wheeljack's voice at this point. Mm -hmm. And he says to Chip. There's no way you could have erased your brain. Anyway, I got a much better use for it. 
And I thought the next line would have been, let me do that. Yeah, yeah. The way he likes, yeah, it's real creepy how he comes in closer like, I, I like, what does he say? Like, I can help you out or something. He says, there's no way you could have raised your brain. I don't remember what the next yeah. line is. And I'm is, like, oh, but... God. And I'm just, with, knowing Will Jack, I'm just imagining. Exactly. Where he literally is well, ripping. He's the... basically saying he has a project. That'll <laughs> I got a project for you. I do not you. trust him at all. I just imagine him, like, literally, like, ripping his head off and pulling <laughs> the brain out. And being like, Here it is. <laughs> Ah, we transition to Megatron and team. They're loading up antimatter, and they're going to head to Autobot headquarters. Teletran will detect the incoming Decepticons. Mm-hmm. Prime is going to give, I'm going to call it a, a moderately rousing speech. Well, this part where they we cut back to the arc, it might, the script might as well have just said murmur, murmur, murmur. Yeah, there's like murmur, 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 murmur. Everybody's just fucking around until Teletran, <laughs> Teletran 1 is like, Decepticons are coming. So, <laughs> so after Prime's speech, we have Sunstreaker oh, and Sideswipe. The Lambo twins. Uh, they head out to conduct Jet Judo. Shout out to Close Kuntosh. Mm-hmm. They fly into the air. They jump on the back of the sequence. I love this se- this sequence. And also, one of them, I can't remember who it is, but I literally calls the other one bro. Yep, it's true. <laughs> so that takes care of a debate we were having in our text messages the other day. <laughs> but... So they transform, they ramp off of a cliff, and then they, they tra- after they ramp off the cliff, they transform back into their robot form. I think it's unknown if they're flying Yeah, or not. It, the implication seems to be that, the, that well, the Lambo twins can fly. Well, what I'm saying, though, is they, they ramp off a cliff, and they transform, and mm-hmm. then they fly through the air, which is kind of a cool move. <laughs> Oh, yeah. They yep. do. They do yep. use the ramp. So maybe they're not flying. They're just I, using the momentum from the cliff. Then they they're step, definitely flying. And they speed up while they're in midair. <laughs> they're <laughs> definitely <laughs> flying. It's amazing. We've got Sunstreaker. He's on the back of Thundercracker. That's to help Ryan out, who doesn't know the difference like between Skywarp uh, and Thundercracker. It's like they're surfing, can't dude. can't keep it straight. Yeah. We've got, uh, and then, yeah, side What you idiots forgot about Skywarp. is me. <laughs> Starscream zooms in to uh, get involved in the situation. It seems like it would be humiliating to be these jets and have these guys on your back. Yeah. But it also seems like you could just transform. Transform. (laughs) (laughs) Starscream manages to knock them off his peeps, and the bros float to the ground. I I love the parachutes. I thought they were color-coordinated parachutes, but I was wrong. Uh, Sideswipes is yellow, and Sunstreakers is yellow. Yeah, they're both the same. Also, the animation in this sequence I think is really good. Yeah, they must have been referring to a different model because at 1904, you've got Sideswipe, a very a close-up of him, and he doesn't have his ears that yeah. uh, are popping off of him. But it's still, it's a cool drawing. It looks good. They're straight out of a Mountain Dew commercial. <laughs> <laughs> do the do. The explosions we see just in the second after that, where they shoot at Prime, is pretty awesome, too. Mm-hmm. The battle is uh, continuing from the ground. Cool exchanges between the Seekers, Wheeljack, Jazz, great laser fire, great explosions. Thundercracker produces some antimatter, which Megatron shoves into his bosom. <laughs> his boobies. He turns into a gun, which Starscream uses to blast Autobots, burying Hound in some debris, and he's firing in all kinds of crazy directions, not seeming to really hit much. I think this is also... Even though, uh, did he have his little shoulder mount thing when he transformed? Let's watch Megatron's transformation. Yeah, so when he transforms, he has his little shoulder mount that's on the back the, of his gun. The brace? The pistol? The bra- the yeah, brace. the brace. But when he lands in oh, Starscream's sure. hands, he doesn't have it. So I don't know if this is the first time we see him without that particular accessory. But he's using it, firing in all kinds of crazy directions. He's got a very sassy pose while he's firing. Megatron, or uh, Starscream is, is the sassiest of Decepticons. Mm-hmm. He's a diva for sure. We see the humans. They've got... This, they're, making, they're making plans. This plan puts the humans in all of the danger. It's true. It's so dangerous. It's true. I love the part, though, where uh, Prime is barreling towards Starscream, and um, Braun is in, a like, a culvert <laughs> and, like, helps him... Like, pushes him over the... It's so cool. Like, I think it's awesome. It also shows how strong Braun is. But why is that ditch there? Why I could could I guess we're to, assume, we're to assume that Prime couldn't drive over that ditch in the first place. I mean, none and of this needs, makes, and he needs Braun there to help him get over it. None and, of this plan makes. And Braun any also sense. probably gives him a little bit extra oomph to the. Because also, the shove. why didn't Starscream just shoot him? Like this yeah. plan makes no sense. Yeah, he could have shot Optimus Prime, and then 
Sky not, so Megatron is knocked out of Starscream's hand by yes. this by this action. Skywarp then picks up the gun. He recovers it. He threatens to kill Spike and Chip with it, who are you know dicking around with his feet down there with a jackhammer <laughs> to distract him. I, yeah, and then so... Chip, yeah, Sky, Skywarp picks up uh, 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 Spike, and then um, Chip comes in and puts a remote onto not... Skywarp's leg. Skywarp's just not very observant, or he's slow. Like just step on it. Skywarp is very dumb. Like it. it is, uh, well, no, it's canon that Skywarp is dumb. Oh, they're just watching this happen to himself. And then also I love where he loses control, where Teletran 1 takes control of him. I mm-hmm. would have loved it if he, like, squeezed... He's got Spike still in his fist. I would have loved it if he squeezed Spike like a toothpaste yeah. tube, and it just got like, shot just out through off. his head. Yeah. I just want Chip to make him, like, hit himself. Like, why are you hitting yourself? <laughs> why are you hitting yourself? Ryan has alluded to is Wheeljack's plan being enacted. The the device that was planted on Skywarp allows Teletran 1 to control Skywarp. And a callback, of course, to the earlier scene where Chip was right. controlling Prowl. Yeah. Skywarp begins firing on his comrades. Megatron disengages from Skywarp, transforms into robot mode, all of a sudden realizes his antimatter is reaching, quote, ignition temperature. Which is not a thing. He flies into the air, ejects the antimatter cubes from his chest, which explode with a Megatron power tits out. So strong that uh, all the Decepticons are injured now yeah. from it. And uh, that's kind of the end of them. They pick themselves up and fly and, away, and flee the scene. And at this point, the Autobots celebrate Chip's general awesomeness as the key to victory. And Megatron realizes that Chip was the key to right. victory. He and rolled. He, he rolled for broke. He swears revenge. When you rolled for broke for Prowl back there, yeah, it's great. And that's the end of the episode. That's the end of the episode. Awesome. That's what happened. All right, guys, have a good week. Yeah, it was nice hanging out <laughs> with you. Oh. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. We got lots of other segments to go. <laughs> Let me just interject then with a, a voice actor segment here. Of the people that we have not covered, mm-hmm. uh, first of all is Michael Horton. He voiced Chip Chase, yes, which is his only voice. He's on 10 episodes of Transformers. It's the only voice he does. His most well-known role um, outside of uh, Transformers in our circle, he did 12 episodes of Murder, she wrote, over the course of 10 years, playing Jessica Fletcher's nephew, <laughs> Grady. And in real life, he married the woman who played his on-screen God, I thought you were going to say Jessica wife. Fletcher. <laughs> Well, I mean, she a hot old lady. Sure. Angel Nothing Williams, wrong. very shout out. Nothing wrong with that. Bed knobs and broomsticks. He, uh, uh, Mr. Horton played, uh, he was in the blue and the gray. He did the Incredible Hulk TV series. He did a show called Laser Tag Academy. Yeah. Did you watch that? No. But I wanted laser tag, but I got the knockoff version, yeah. like Photon Games or whatever <laughs> it was. Gem Spider-Man, a show called Zazu You, uh, the Legend of Prince Valiant, uh, ER episode uh, called Good Touch, Bad Touch. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> he also had the extreme pleasure of meeting me. Absolutely. <laughs> ah. And of course, Mike Seibert at TFCon LA this year. I was eating at the bar. Yeah, as I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he showed up and, and ate there too. And so we chatted for probably ninety minutes. He was a nice guy. He had no, amazing. He had no clue about our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's a patron. <laughs> He, you know, he had no idea that this role that he did had any impact at all, that people cared one, I, I one can bit. Imagine. Yeah. Uh, so he was blown away by the reception of him being there. This was, a, I guess, a market he'd never tapped to this retro. I market. touch on this uh, much more in the next episode, but his portrayal like, is so earnest and mm-hmm. like pure mm-hmm. as Chip Chase. I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, he uh, was very happy. Hopefully we'll see him at, at other conventions. Uh, also, it, somebody we never covered was Ken Sampson. He did 29 episodes of The Transformer. He played the Transformer. Mm. He played Hound, uh, also Reflector in one episode. Oh. Uh, but he is most notable. He was the voice of Rabbit in Winnie the Pooh oh. from 1988 to 2009. Uh other work ranged from on-screen roles on The Odd Couple, Jimmy Stewart Show, All in the Family, Charlie's Angels, Welcome Back, Cotter, Chips, also on Murder, She Wrote. Quincy uh, did voiceovers <laughs> Quincy. on uh, The Snorks, a.k.a. Broke Dick Smurfs. Yep. 
And Underwater Smurfs. Also is on Gem. <laughs> Alvin and the Chipmunks, which I spelled Chipmunks as in Chipmunks, M O N K. I want to see that That's show. A good idea. I would like to see that one. <laughs> We gotta copyright that now. <laughs> so that's it on the voice actor segment. So it seems we've been doing a thing, uh, I guess, talking about the real world. In the real world. So this was October thirteenth, nineteen eighty four, which was a Saturday in the American Top Forty. After two weeks at number one, that song "Let's Go Crazy" by Prince and the Revolution falls to number two. Now, the new number one song in the USA by the Motown superstar who loved performing so much that there was a time he had to be physically carried off the stage kicking and singing because he'd never leave on his own. This is just one chapter in the story of Stevie Wonder. Stevie first set foot in the Motown studios in Detroit when he was only nine years old. It was just a visit and not business. But from then on, that's where he headed almost every day after school. He'd go there to hang around and play whatever musical instruments he could find in the studios. A Motown producer named Clarence Paul, who later became Stevie's conductor, said Stevie was a pest in those days. But the label recognized his talents and encouraged him, and finally recorded him. In his teens, he became part of the Motown Review. That was a bus tour of Motown stars. And according to Clarence Paul, Stevie would get such a charge out of performing to the live audiences that he wouldn't leave the stage. And Clarence would have to walk out there, pick Stevie up bodily, and carry him off kicking and singing. Well, these days, Stevie Wonder still loves to sing and make music more than anything else. The difference is, when he starts playing, nobody wants him to stop. How else could he have acquired eight number one songs? The eighth and the latest of those number ones moves into the top spot on the soul and the pop charts. Here is Stevie Wonder with the new number one song in the land from the movie The Woman in Red. I just called to say I love you. No New Year's Day. Um, the number one movie was still Teachers, as we discussed in our last episode. Uh, maybe the same movie in the next episode. I can't remember. Uh, I did go for three weeks, so I guess by definition it has to be. Um, on the cover, oh, on the cover of TV Guide, everybody's past and current favorite dad, Dr. Bill Cosby. Hmm. It was uh, he and Keisha Knight Pullum, Rudy of the Cosby Show. Uh, so I'm a rapist, Rudy. The article was witness the humors of Bill Cosby on screen and off. So, oh, oh. <laughs> mm. and this definitely was. I mean, I think it dates back to the seventies, right? His uh, crimes, barbiturate activity. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's it, everybody enjoy that. All right. <laughs> uh, th- some trivia. Uh, you know, our younger listeners, it's probably just like there's Bill Cosby, the rapist. They don't have this context of. Him as like the most popular entertainer in America. <laughs> for a while, that we lived through America's <laughs> dad. Really weird. And a role model for fatherhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rudy. Okay. Theo. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we all did it. Uh, okay, so some trivia uh, on uh, October thirteenth, nineteen eighty four. John Henry becomes the first thoroughbred horse to win six million dollars. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, the thirteenth space shuttle mission, the Challenger six. Uh, landed back on Earth, the first to carry a crew of seven, the first to carry two women, Sally Ride and Catherine Sullivan, the first American EVA with a woman, Sullivan, the first American with a beard, Paul Scully Power, <laughs> the first Canadian astronaut. Where do you think he derived his power? Exactly. Oh. <laughs> the first Canadian astronaut, Mark Garneau. Uh, NASA began a tradition of playing music to astronauts during the Gemini program and First, this was the first time they used mu- music to wake up a flight crew in Apollo 15, but each track was specifically chosen, often by astronauts' families, and they usually had a special meaning. So on this flight, it was Flash Dance, What a Feeling, hmm. and the theme from Rocky. And oh my God, I can't wait to go to space. I'm definitely going to space. Nice. You'll get there. Yeah. I will get there, buddy. That's all for the real world. Rip deviations. <laughs> We do have some script deviations. Um, on the front cover of the original script, in huge letters, it says, Note! Billy has been renamed Chip. <laughs> so it's going to be Billy. Interesting. 
Yeah, it was going to be Billy. It's written by Douglas Booth on July or June 15th, 1984, revised by Ron Friedman on June 26th and um, July 2nd. There's not that much different. Mostly there's a lot of change of dialogue. Um, when Prime and the Autobots roll into the dam, the original Prime line is, all right, good buddies, this has got to be the place. <laughs> and I do like the Ron change of, like, conflict zone up ahead yeah, is what yeah, he yeah. changes it to. So I give him a lot of shit, but that was a good one. There is, okay. So the Decepticon jets, as the jets wheel around at the very end for another run, there's Wind Charger. Like, this is a, a small but powerful Autobot who charges up his magnetic fields, which are clearly visible as lines of force radiating out from his body, with accompanying electronic style sound effects. Wind Charger taunting the jets. I dare you to try that again! Starscream and Thundercracker angling towards Wind Charger, armament blazing. With pleasure, you force field fathead. <laughs> and then in the wide, when they enter the radiating lines of magnetic force, close up on Starscream, he's suddenly flipped upside down, and he says, What's happening? <laughs> Windcharger <laughs> grins savagely. I've got a magnetic personality. <laughs> and as we see the both Starscream and Thundercracker out of control, flying crazily past Windcharger, but still under the influence of invisible lines of force, Finally crashing into each other and tumbling to Earth. That writer was, was so Wind proud of even himself. in this episode? No, really this is a whole gave, bit that was taken him, out. Gave him a hot, uh, hot I just thought there. it was so funny. Yeah. Fathead. Uh, yeah. Let's rate the scheme real quick here. The, the scheme, the basic, it's a pretty basic scheme. The basic of the scheme is break in, uh, get this antimatter formula. Antimatter rules, uh, lets the Decepticons rule the world. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call it very poor, if nothing else, based on all the science that you <laughs> relayed to us about antimatter. I will say, if I forget that an- the way antimatter really works, I'll give it a 6 out of 10. A six? Because it's at least something different. Like, they try to do something different than just stealing energy. It's but they, they making sent it, they, But they sent it, They also sent Laserbeak to go attack uh, Chip and Spike and Bumblebee for no reason whatsoever. They could have maybe pulled this off if they hadn't done That's that fair. one thing. <laughs> that seems like a random tactic. I'll say it's a poor scheme. However, I think the writers had to write a, had to write a scheme around the overarching theme of Chip. Mm-hmm. And so I will kind of forgive them a little bit to try to fit this like technical thing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. antimatter and and data transfer. Mm-hmm. Floppy disks. Floppy Doctors. Disks. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can see what they're trying to do. I think that they could have done a better job, but I it's will forgive true. them a little bit. How and maybe they just of... needed action. It's like maybe yeah. you have, maybe there's a They're thing like, where you have uh, to have uh, action. Yeah, so yeah, many yeah, beats. Yeah. You, this feels a little slow here. What are we gonna do? Yeah. Make laser beak attack them. Sure, yeah. that's true. That's true. They're kids. Kids are gonna have notice. So kids are gonna be judging. I'll give them. A, I'll forgive them a little because they're trying to fit it around that theme of Chip, mm-hmm. which is uh, overcoming or overcoming disability. I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Which will be even more on the nose in the exactly. next episode. A little bit. Uh, so more chip to come. Well then, hey, let's talk about our... All right, so, okay, we can... We can... I am the ghost of the iconic moment! <laughs> you know? um, for me, it's just the arrival of Chip Chase. I love mm-hmm. this character so much. Like, I, I don't think like I, as I've mentioned in previous episodes we don't need the human element to quote unquote connect to because we want to be the robots we commun- we connect with the robots but if there were a human that I would say I connect to it would have been Chip Chase I don't have an iconic moment for this nothing in it, not, no single thing really sticks out sure. to me I also like that they reference the internet yeah for me I, it's visual it's really just that that scene where Starscream uh, at the very beginning, shoves Prime to the side, jumps, mm-hmm. transforms, flies in front of the, the rainbow waterfall, and then the bumbling sound waves <laughs> yes. Just yes. running through it's the net that is scene. there for no reason. I love it. I love uh, it. I remember that as a kid. I even I also remember the droopy nose cones yep. as a kid. I remember thinking that was a bit weird. So just visually, those are things that when I, I haven't probably it's probably been decades since I've seen this episode that I was like, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I guess that's it, guys. That's it. Let's wrap this, wrap this bitch <laughs> up. Wrap it up and wrap it uh, up. Let's see. APDC store still exists. Patreon. <laughs> Go check it out. Please continue to listen, subscribe to the show. Apple Play. Apple Apple Podcasts Apple Podcast. is what they call it. Stitcher. Google Play, rather. Five stars, please. Tune in. 
Yeah, leave a review. Love to shout out the reviews. And our social media, APOD Decast, or at APOD Decast. Mm -hmm. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and the website, autopoddecepticast.com. Come and yeah, like I said, if you want to throw a few shekels our way, peep that Patreon, baby. Patreon.com slash apoddcast. Get some goodies. Mm-hmm. Thanks, everybody. How was this episode, Aaron? When you ask me, it's not fun. Bye, bye, bye. 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 All right. <laughs> West and I were talking last night about we got on like a 30 minute jag just talking about channel numbers we remember from childhood like on cable I was like yeah USA was 39 oh really and like VH1 was 56 and she was telling me the channels from Omaha and I'm like I don't know how this is entertaining but we talked about it for a while wow good for you guys <laughs> I uh, did not have cable that's true. You didn't have for, like, the whole time you lived at home, right? Correct. Wow. Yeah, I got it really early. I remember specifically, I think I was in first or second grade, I remember specifically my parents telling me, like, now this doesn't mean you can just sit and watch TV, cut to me just sitting and watching TV. Yes, like making a lifestyle out of it. Absolutely. I would go through bursts of cable, no cable. Like, we were poor, but I guess when mom would get, like, a tax return or something, all of a sudden... Cable! Yeah, yeah, souped up cable. <laughs> and I would do that. I would just watch Nickelodeon all day. It's like their... Pinwheel, pro- baby. It's like their programming was just exactly what I needed at the time. And I would n- watch every single show up to and including when they would switch formats to Nick at Night at like Saturday. I loved the, Nick at Night. The biggest cable thing I, of my childhood was when me and Aaron went to my grandmother's house and watched the <laughs> 19... What? 90? 91? Yeah. VMAs, which for mm-hmm. some reason... Were the VMAs? A, yeah. Video oh, Musical wow. Awards. No, Arsenio know, Hall was hosting it, wasn't it? Yeah, and that's where, P, that's where P, Paul Rubens came on. Oh, yeah. And it was a, I guess that was a particularly memorable one. They're trash now. I, they just had one, didn't they? Yeah. If you, what was the tr- controversy from it? It's just, anymore, it's just like, you know what's going to happen, and it's just super, like, there's nothing interesting about it. <laughs> There's nothing interesting about it anymore. I mean, it is it's disingenuous so, by the fact that it, MTV doesn't play videos also. It's just, so how can you have yeah, a VMA? It's just What so, entitles you to even just, have that ceremony? Yeah, it's just so industry now, and, and I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> Get off my lawn! Yeah. <laughs> well, VMA? Back in my day, the VMAs were good. We had, um, like, then this was like... Back in the, whenever we had cable, the time before a cable box, so you could like sometimes hover between channels and see like, we had had HBO for free for like three years. Nice. (laughs) And that's where I saw my first boobies. Yeah. (laughs) She saw that guy. I used to like get up, to get up really early in the morning and watch. Pornography? Not pornography, it was HBO. Like there was no pornography. It's not pornography, it's HBO. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. Be in that mode to move. Back in my day, HBO was sleazy and we loved it. <laughs> um, I did love that that intro, the flying through the intro. Yeah, that nice. was the best. Is is Cinemax still around? Yeah. Skinemax. Yeah, exactly. That yeah, what was you the other get one? to see HBO, and... Cinemax, and Showtime. Mm-hmm. Cinemax was very like after like 10 p.m. It was just boobs and bush. Yeah. Like I remember Red Shoe Diaries. I think that I don't know if that was HBO or Cinemax, but it was David Duchovny who later turns out is a sex addict. Um, which there's a joke about that in uh, fucking the X Files where he is in somebody else's body but wakes up watching porn. Uh-huh. It gets weird. Anyway, I think that was a, a thing. Now that what we know about David Duchovny, I think he added that to the script. <laughs> I just want to watch some porn, guys. Californication. Brew Cells is the sponsor of Autopod Decepticast. Yes, 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 yes.